Francis. It's a true pleasure. It's an honor to be here. It's a special honor to be a speaker in a church. I think the last time I was a speaker in church, I was 10 years old. I was, <laughs> I was playing Joseph at our annual Christmas uh, play that we had in Germany. And actually, after that, there was a time when I wasn't going to church for for quite some time. And it was Africa, it was Nigeria, where I found back uh, found back to church. And therefore, I'm especially humbled uh, to be a speaker to be a speaker today at at this wonderful seminar. Um, Biron and I, we have, I think, we have pre uh, prepared a few things on the topic of purpose, purpose, plans, and pursuit. And um, I want to speak about it from a bit from the business perspective, from, from what we have experienced, what purpose can mean in, in a business context. Uh, we've seen a lot talking about it, I, I assume, in, in private lives, in your own lives. What does purpose mean for yourself? What does purpose mean for even a country, a nation, a continent. And I believe purpose applies to any system, any, any organization, and therefore also for companies. And I want to shed some light on a perspective what purposeful organizations could, could be. And before I do that, um, some quick, quick background on myself. Pastor Francis has already told that um, about my background. Um, I've been a management consultant for five years, worked with company executives and uh, a number of different functions and companies across the world. Um, I've been a manager in Switzerland. I've led a large initiative there, uh, which was about global sourcing, about a Swiss company working with an Indian, partnering with an Indian vendor. And here's a bit what, what describes uh, maybe my journey um, and, and what, I, what I experienced when I came here for the first time. Now, there's a few countries which are blue on there. Um, that's the countries where I have lived, Germany, Switzerland, and the United States. Uh, that's called linear active countries. That's cool, factual, decisive planners. That's Germans, right? That's what everybody knows, uh, even here, what Germans are known for. Structured, organized, planned. Now the whole world seems to be much more red, which is something called multi-active, warm, emotional, impulsive. Things you want to completely avoid in Germany, especially if you go look into management. And that's why, why I learned so much here. Uh, what I could use when I um, became managing director here in Africa in an internet company was maybe my intuition about people. But everything else I learned in business school in the United States, what I learned in management in, in large companies, almost all of that didn't really apply. <laughs> like, take the example of, of planning uh, in Germany, when I had a large project, I had a calendar and this was filled for the next six or eight weeks. And, I had meetings, at least five meetings every day, and often I didn't have even a slot of um, working for myself um, beyond these meetings. And if somebody came and said, hey, we, I want to discuss this, this is urgent, I had to look at my calendar and could I really squeeze this in or should I do it next week? And here I'm managing 80 people without a calendar and, <laughs> and it sounds ridiculous, but it works. That's the, the fascinating thing. If everybody, if your clients, if your partners, if your customers, if your employees are used to work and live this way, it can actually work. There's sometimes we feel, oh, we should implement a lot more of what we have in Western countries. And yes, there is some efficiency that comes with structuring and planning, but maybe that's just on the surface. Maybe that's because we sometimes are too comfortable in the way we live and maybe it's sometimes a few excuses to say, oh, of course I didn't come to uh, your meeting because of traffic and these things. Maybe that's just on the surface. Maybe deep inside there's something 
about the spontaneously uh, spontaneity about emotionalness about impulsiveness that western countries can actually learn from from these multi uh, multi active uh, countries and that's that's a bit my story of of the last two and a half years that i wanted to share it so here's what i want to talk about mainly uh, purpose-driven organizations what if companies could find their purpose could see where god wants them to be in in this world and the subtitles are what if we stop trying to force the future into existence what if instead we simply dance with what wants to emerge I mean, that's that's powerful questions that's that's going deep because if we think about normal corporations normal corporate uh, standards in the west but probably everywhere the paradigm of achievement the paradigm of getting something done it's a bit like like if you ask them for purpose if you look at what purpose is lived it's sometimes a bit like that our purpose that will motivate everyone to peak performance is to selflessly serve our customers in order to rake in fat profits otherwise our competitors will crash us don't we all know these these words if you work in large companies and that's a bit the same thing if we um, talk about purpose for individuals i think there's also um, if we ask ourselves what would we do if we had no limitations what's our dreams and the first thing that sometimes pops up is a bit these things money I want to be rich I want to be powerful I want to be the one who has whatever uh, but, but that's a bit on the surface because there's something deeper and the same I think can apply to organizations there can be a deeper purpose that organizations can find and if that's what guiding you, it can be something quite amazing. And uh, this is actually based on a book. It's called Reinventing Organizations. Uh, I have it uh, later on. And it's quite, it's basically, it's talking about the next paradigm of management. It's not talking about a theory. It's talking about something that wants to emerge in all businesses, in every one of us. And it's kind of the next the next paradigm of management I believe now let me give you a concrete example of one of these companies that according to this book live this um, next paradigm of what could be called a soulful organization or a purpose-driven organization that's uh, I would pronounce it boots probably that was not totally correct but that is a uh, Dutch company they're in the healthcare space they're in a neighborhood nursing company what happened in the healthcare space and it's a story which is especially interesting here in Africa where probably um, this um, this mess that is sometimes present in, in Western companies is not yet present like neighborhood nursing um, at one point the Western governments wanted to make it more efficient like Healthcare is getting more and more expensive, so we need to apply management structures to healthcare organizations. So they uh, said, okay, we need to have a big structure like we have in another organization. We have to have plans, we have to have KPIs, measures how we measure every nurse. Every nurse has to visit 10 patients every day. Every nurse has to do that much of this, that much of that. For every visit of a patient, they need to spend five minutes on that and two minutes on that. And that's how you optimize time. Because if you look at the actual facts, you see they spend way too much time on this. They could do it much faster. That's a bit the old paradigm, right? Achievement, trying to measure, trying to optimize, trying to control it from a central headquarter, from above, trying to think you know it better than the actual nurse now what um, and in the Netherlands it seems like it came to a point where it was even over the top which is why this company uh, they started 
the same thing that was actually present way back, um, back in the days, like when in the 60s, I think, that's where they came back to a company where you don't have overhead, you have just 25 people in the headquarter and thousands of nurses uh, across the country. A country where, uh, or a company where nurses actually run the business. They sit in, and you can see it in the picture, they sit in uh, teams together, one team for one neighborhood, and each team is responsible for their neighborhood. They talk to their, uh, they decide which people they visit on the day, they decide how long they will stay with the patient, they decide on everything, even on financials, on accounting, on, on everything that is part of the business. And if they have a success story, then they just share it um, and see how the others react. There's nobody who decides if um, a successful idea should be implemented anywhere else. They just share it, they post it in an intranet, they give speeches, and then it will automatically, if it's the right thing, of course the others will adopt it. And if it's not, then it will be tested and something else will be tested over time. It's a beautiful concept. And, as I said, it's, it's especially um, interesting because I think in, this is the most natural way how you can do nursing. Because this is about nursing, this is not about managing. But sometimes we have forgotten about that. And I think in Africa we are in a place where it's the easiest to reconnect to this old way, this way which is the most natural way of doing things. And it even relates a bit to the Bible, I think, when it says uh, man should not rule over man or something similar to that. Um, like there shouldn't be a boss telling others what to do. There could be something where people manage themselves. Obviously, this is something that is quite visionary, quite future, something that it's also hard to just push that and implement that from one day to the other, but it's something that wants to emerge, I think, that wants to be the next paradigm of, of who we are and where we live. Now, this is especially funny from this book. Um, the most normal thing, but it's a revolution in this company, in this country, that uh, the first thing a nurse from this organization does with a new patient is to sit down and drink coffee. Because <laughs> the managers didn't like that. The managers wanted to spend five minutes and then leave and go to the next patient. And the funny thing is, uh, by implementing this approach, in the end, they spent much less time with the patients. Because they didn't want all these visits again and again. One drink of coffee can sometimes, probably, or whatever it takes can sometimes be much more beneficial for the health of a patient than, than all those visits and all those medicine that they they uh, get. And there's a number of other practices which um, they do, which are different to other companies. You can read it in this uh, book that I will share. And it's super successful. Um, the founder is consulting his competitors. Uh, he's really passionate about the idea and much more than about the actual imp um, impact in terms of money. And he has already now taken over some of the competitors and integrated them into his company recently because it's so successful. And his idea is actually, in the long run, this should be public domain. Nursing shouldn't even be a company anymore. But he has to be the, or this company needs to be the, the one that starts the initiative. Quite an interesting story. So again, this new paradigm, um, in the old paradigm, if managers would ride a bike, I mean, this is a bit uh, stereotyping, but if old managers, would, old, old paradigm managers would ride a bike, they would, they would first try to um, see how others ride a bike, study it well, then make a plan how exactly one would hold the handle, how one would steer, who would need which resources to steer the bike. Then there would be managers in place, project managers who have Gantt charts, who put in place controls and make sure that everything goes according to that plan. 
And then we get on the bicycle in these companies, typically not the managers, typically other people get on the bicycle, uh, close their eyes because they don't know what it's about, uh, hold the handle in the exact angle that was calculated and try to steer according to plan. <laughs> Now what obviously sometimes happens is that with this approach, sometimes you don't see what's, what's around you. You don't see the obstacles that come up on the way that can't be controlled, that can't be planned. And then as part of this, obviously there's also the aspect of blaming. Like once you do a mistake, like there needs to be somebody accountable for it. There needs to be somebody who can be blamed for it. And once they're, you have blamed somebody, you learn from it, and you try to make a better plan because that's why it didn't work. It's obviously a bit of a caricature, but the most natural way of how to ride a bike is actually a different one. And we can even run companies, I believe, at one point uh, that way. We are just present uh, when we ride a bike with all our senses. Consciously and unconsciously, we adjust to reality in front of us. There's not just one, there's not one plan and we execute it. There's constant uh, sensing, constant responding to what's around us. And maybe if we're mindful as we ride, we might, might discover a shorter way. There's also not this disconnect between managers and execution staff uh, that we have very often. Something that especially I experienced when I uh, was managing a company here, there was the, the manager often coming from Western countries and there was the execution often done from people uh, from Nigeria and there was a big disconnect culturally, organizationally, but also of, of course if the innovation, if the purpose doesn't come from, from all aspects of a company, then people who execute don't know what the plan actually is and, and obviously fail. In this case, the person who writes is the person who decides where to go, uh, which is part of the beauty of it. Uh, the book describes this new paradigm of uh, companies a bit like a living system, uh, just like a forest. A forest also doesn't have any plan, doesn't have anybody who controls it. But a forest is very adaptive. Uh, over millions of years, a forest can sustain. If new uh, environments come, then every little leaf, every little tree, every little plant adjusts and somehow flows with what is needed. And that's a bit the, the way how corporations could look like in the future. Now, having said that, um, we are trying to implement that as, at uh, African Founders, which is the company that uh, we have set up. But it's, at the same time, it's very hard. It's something, if you've lived in, in management for a while, it's very hard to give up of being the one who's in charge and not knowing things better than others. And it's very, very complicated. So. My experience is it, it's a process that wants to emerge and step by step you let go of what you're used to and step by step you learn that there's something even bigger inside you and we're, we're still on the way of finding our implementation of, of that new, new paradigm but I believe that this is, this is just the, the next, next thing that naturally wants to come. Um, this is the book, uh, Frederic Laloux, Reinventing Organizations. It's a book that basically studies uh, 12 of these organizations um, that follow this, this course um, of, that can be called soulful organizations or purpose-driven organizations. Second part of um, the speech, I want to look at um, more concretely <clears throat> what, what we have come up with recently as our vision of a technology-enabled Nigeria or technology-enabled transformation in Nigeria. Because um, we're internet entrepreneurs, we're currently developing 
an app in the healthcare space. It's an app called Doctor Dial, where you can have a video chat uh, with a doctor, uh, where you can find health information, where you can find um, everything around health, everything you need when you are in need for healthy tips and uh, for health tips. And um, that's basically where we're in. But we notice there's some. We believe in that, that our app can be successful. It's something that has worked in India, for example, very well, in rural India especially. So we believe this is ready for Africa, and there's a number of signals for that. But I also think it would be even more beautiful if there was, this was part of a bigger vision, and that's what I want to show. In, uh, can I steer this? Or maybe you need to go to the next slide, because it's not a slide deck. Basically, um, we, yesterday we had a good discussion and one of the questions was around what can be done um, globally and what can be done locally in the internet space. So if you look at Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft, they all come from the west coast in the United States and that's where you have a huge ecosystem of entrepreneurs. So can Africa compete with that? The first answer is obviously you should um, stay to African problems. Solve something that can only be solved with significant presence here, can only be solved here. And if you go further, there are some things that are even uh, world leading that can be solved here. The, the most famous example might be uh, mobile payment. Uh, East Africa is the leader in mobile payment worldwide. Salaries are paid with an SMS-enabled smartphone. Uh, every shop, every corner shop on the street has uh, M-Pesa, which means you can transfer money from one phone to the other. That's something that doesn't exist anywhere in the world this way, and also doesn't exist in Nigeria. Now, why doesn't it exist in Nigeria? One of the reasons might be because there's many different stakeholders in the system of banking, in the system of uh, um, money, um, and there was a disconnect uh, between all of them. There was lobbying, there was banks with their own solutions, there was a higher advancement of, of Nigeria at that point why more people actually had a bank account. Um, but I think this is also one thing where we actually can um, see a change even in Nigeria, where if we have banks, online companies, and telcos all work together, um, there shouldn't be anything limiting us to having mobile payment, because we know that there's a big pain of having cash everywhere in everything. It could be much easier the way they do it in Kenya, just with a mobile phone, transfer money from one to the other with no hassle, and it works. Um, so this is actually um, the same thing applied to healthcare, the space that we're in at the moment. You also have these puzzle pieces. You have a lot of beautiful initiatives in this country. Uh, startups, I know a lot of startups who do good things in the healthcare space. Uh, there's life banks, there's doctor consultation apps, um, there's medical directories, there's e-pharmacies, there's a lot going on in that space, but it's at a very early stage. Then telcos are getting into that space, they have emergency numbers, they have a number of initiatives that they do. Government is also doing their part, they're um, doing provisions of hospitals, health insurance is a big topic being discussed, I understand, and a number of other things that government is doing. Hospitals have their own solutions, and IT companies have their solutions, so there is a lot possible um, out there and a lot being uh, tried. But what's missing is maybe the integration of all these puzzle pieces. Which is, and this again is a vision, it's not the first step, but I believe there could be amazing potential if we would just bring together or see come together all these stakeholders into one thing. Uh, this would mean, this would need more hospitals, it would need more training, 
but it would also need a technology component, we believe, um, which would be a central cloud, some, some place where you store your health information, where a doctor, after he consults you, actually stores your, uh, your information, your record, where your blood group is stored, where all your basic information and your medical record is uh, stored, where hospitals can be rated and can be verified and validated, where every doctor can be um, accessed if, if it's a real doctor or if they're... Uh, it might be not. <laughs> Which I hear is a big problem. Just, just imagine what that means. Like an emergency line right now is just an emergency line. If this was the case, if you had such a cloud, like you could call this emergency line, they would automatically detect your phone number, they would automatically know who you are, they would know which insurance you have, if you have any, and therefore which hospital would be able to treat you. They would even maybe know more about how you can be treated at this moment in case there's a funding issue. They would know your blood group, they would know your next of kin and inform that person. All these things are things that are really revolutionary, things that are not even in place in, in Western countries. But I believe uh, there's reasons why this could be implemented here earlier uh, than elsewhere. I mean, there's initiatives in Western countries, but they fail for a number of reasons because of privacy concerns, because of concerns that there's already existing systems all re uh, everywhere in place. But well, here we could create it from, from the scratch. So that's just uh, one of the use cases, and there's so many other use cases. Um, there could be, in rural areas, there could be health extension workers using an app which connects to a specialist doctor if there's no doctor around. I mean, how many people don't have access to a qualified doctor in rural areas? There could be online training, guiding, uh, in addition to offline training initiatives. Like, you have a training for nurses two weeks on-site, but then you have regular one, uh, weekly mentoring by somebody from, uh, from the city. And you can have e-learning uh, as part of that. And there's so many more use cases that you can have if you just bring these stakeholders together. And that's what we're also trying to do, trying to convince Western governments that this is something that is already wanting to come here. All they would need to do is maybe facilitate it, maybe pull the trigger, not pull the trigger, but um, enable it. Uh, and same for local governments, for governments in Nigeria. Like, all they would need is what's in the center of, of uh, that. And then there is these other stakeholders. There's large IT companies that we're also talking to that want to build their solutions that they have that haven't been applied uh, professionally in, in, in many cases, but that are really suitable for that uh, solution. So if you bring all of them together, there could be a lot. Uh, not going on. That's, that's what we believe in. And uh, where we, in our role as a startup, want to play our role. Now, the same thing you can see in, even in other areas. The same thing is true for agriculture. Uh, you have a lot of initiatives, but if you had a central database for which crop is produced where, which farmer is producing what, which marketplace is how reliable, which wholesaler actually pays, then there could be a lot of scenarios um, that you could imagine that could lead to higher outcomes, higher efficiency in the agricultural space, which is obviously one of the uh, push topics of, of uh, current legislation in Nigeria. Same for employment. You could also have a central job database where government, or at least where a central cloud, uh, plays a role. Mobile payment. There's so many areas where this integration uh, can be of benefit. Yeah, here's again what, what we're doing in that space. Um, I guess, yeah, not necessary to talk about that now. Maybe you don't will talk about it later, what exactly our um, contribution to that is. This is our team, currently about 12 people. Some of them you know, at least Ademola, I think, is part of this community. So if you could change back to the other presentation, please.
want to close with a few quotes that uh, we have put up in our office actually but inspired honestly by by Ibridge Hub and by what you see around here with the nice quotes everywhere and they're um, they're actually quite quite suitable on on the topic of purpose because purpose is what what's what's underlying in so many things don't worry about being successful but work towards being significant and the successful naturally follow I think that's exactly what this new paradigm of management uh, displays. Like those companies, they make money, they are successful, but it's a consequence more than it is actually a deliberate intention. And the maybe most popular quote of Steve Jobs, especially the second part, most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. That's, that's the same thing. Like We want to control everything in an organization, but maybe the organization already knows what it wants to become. And it's a bit like a child that just needs its time to find its uh, purpose in this world. But... That will grow up at one point. Live as, as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. There's no passion being found in playing small, in settling for a life that is less than one you're capable of living. That's in line with purpose. And last but not least, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. So I think that's a good, a good closing remark uh, uh, from, from my side. So, okay, I think uh, we will continue with questions later. Thank you.